Good morning. This morning we're pleased to have Buddy Johnson with us as our guest speaker. Buddy and his family uh, reside in Cookville, Tennessee, where Buddy was a minister for the Jefferson Avenue Church of Christ from 2001 until 2019. He graduated from Lipscomb University, where he earned a Bible degree with an emphasis on preaching. He also earned a master's in New Testament from Fried Hardman University and is currently working on his master's of divinity. His wife, Angela, is a kindergarten teacher at Capshaw Elementary School. Also, Buddy and his wife, Angela, have three children, Luke, 15, who is with us here today, Abby, age 12, and Levi, age 9. So we welcome you, you Buddy, and we look forward to uh, your lesson this morning. Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you here today. Thank you for choosing to be here on the Lord's Day. If you're visiting today, I am too. And so uh, glad you're here, and I'm sure the members here will welcome you. You know, I'm, I'm excited to be here, and I asked Merritt as I met her just a few minutes ago, what's the best thing about worshiping here at Highland Heights? And she said, we are friendly. And I think that's a great quality to have. So thank you for allowing us to be here. I'm sorry that my wife and daughter could not be here the daughter is sick and the wife's under the weather too, so it's just that time of year. Those school teachers catch everything the kids have. But we're going to focus on the Lord this morning and we're going to talk about evangelism today. So if you would, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. And let's look one more time at those verses. This will be our, our scriptural basis for both the lesson and the class today. These uh, words are Jesus' words before He left His disciples to ascend into heaven. And He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age." I love that passage, don't you? This is our mission. These are our marching orders. This is what God wants us to do. Sometimes we do, and sometimes we don't. Let me share a little story with you as we begin this morning. Once upon a time, there was a church that was not evangelistic. It had been a long time since she had converted people in any numbers. It had been many years since the baptistry was regularly used. The church had settled into a comfortable routine of Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. The same people, the same pews. But it wasn't always this way. There was a time when this church was a vibrant, growing congregation. The gospel was taught, souls were saved, churches were planted, and everyone was on fire for the Lord. It was a thrilling time in the life of this church. New families were coming in every Sunday. Entire weeks were devoted to door knocking and mission trips and campaigns. The latest technologies were being used and people were coming to Christ. But over the years... Their zeal cooled. Their fire began to smolder. Their focus changed from evangelism to maintenance. After all, it takes a great deal of time and money to manage a large congregation. People's needs must be met. Budgets must be met. And so their main focus changed from bringing those on the outside in to keeping those on the outside out. And they were successful. They kept everybody on the outside out. After all, some said we must maintain the purity of the church. And so we need to keep everybody with problems out. And they did. 
Over time, they began to fear any new change. Let's just keep things the same, they said. If we do that, we'll be okay. And so they kept everything the same, and they began to wither. The young people grew older, and the older people went on to their reward, and the church was slowly dying. Sadly, she was only a shell of her former self. Because their numbers had dwindled, they couldn't offer as many programs as they had in the past. It took all of their funds to pay a part-time preacher and keep the lights on. And the hallways, which once echoed with the laughter and vitality of children, were now ghostly silent. Now it is true that in some instances silence is golden, but not in the church. And a decade later, the few who remained were forced to make a decision they did not want. They turned off the lights and they closed their doors. Now the story I've just shared with you began with fairy tale language. Did you notice that once upon a time? But I think you see in that story something that has happened in, in several of our congregations across the brotherhood. In fact, you may have at one time been a part of a church that went through this life cycle. And although I used fairy tale language to begin, this is also a cautionary tale because we have seen this play out in churches across the world. Question. Do any of you know which were the largest congregations in Nashville in the 1950s? Think about that, because a lot of times when I say that, somebody will say, well, it was the Madison Church of Christ. And, and they were the largest in the 60s and 70s and 80s when Ira North was there, and they had four or 5,000 members. But in the 1950s, the two largest churches in Nashville were the Charlotte Avenue Church of Christ and the Volte Church of Christ. Any of you ever worshipped at Charlotte Avenue or Volte? All right, I see a few hands. Where are they now? They don't exist. They closed their doors. These congregations had 800 people in the 1950s and they're no longer meeting today. But why? Because they lost their focus. They quit doing what God said to do. In the 1950s and 60s, we were the fastest growing religious group in America. For the young people who are here today, I don't know if you know that, but in the 50s and 60s, the Churches of Christ were the fastest growing religious group in America. And we, we wrote books about evangelism. And maybe you've read some of these books like this. You Can Do Personal Work by Otis Gatewood. Or Let's Go Fishing for Men by Homer Haley. Or From House to House by Ivan Stewart. Or You Can March for the Master by Ira North. Go ye means go me. Any of you ever read any of those books? Those sound familiar? We were focused on the mission of Christ and the apostles. But sadly, in many circles today, the great commission that we read about here in Matthew 28 has become the great omission. In fact, it has been estimated... It has been estimated that 95% of church members have never led anyone to Christ. I want you to think about that. One of England's greatest preachers, W.E. Sangster, said, The easiest way to embarrass a congregation is to ask them two simple questions. Number one, when is the last time you personally led another person to Jesus Christ? And number two, when is the last time you tried? Now please understand, I'm not here today to embarrass you. I don't want to do that. But I do want us to ask these two questions. When is the last time that you personally led someone to Jesus Christ? And when is the last time you tried? Folks, I stand before you today to say that the mission of the church has not changed. And so what I want us to do is look back to the New Testament and to see the, the roots and, and the foundation for evangelism. And then we'll talk about some practical aspects at the end of the lesson. First, let's look at John chapter 3 and verse 16 and 17. 
What is the basis of our motivation for evangelism? What is the reasoning? Why should we do what I'm asking you to do this morning? I think we find it in John 3 and verse 16. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He what? That He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's the old King James. That's what I was raised on. We know that verse, right? God loved the world. And that means the good people and the bad people and everybody in between. He loved them so much that He sent His Son to die on the cross for their sins. Why? Because He wanted them to experience eternal life in heaven with Him. And just in case we miss out, he goes on to write in verse 17, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. So many people have this picture of, of God as this uh, imposing being in heaven and He's looking down on us with His little black book and He's just looking to catch us in a sin. And brothers and sisters, that is not a biblical picture of our loving Father. Oh, He doesn't want us to sin in the same way that you don't want your children to sin or go astray. But He loves us with an everlasting love and it's His love that is the motivation for our evangelism. God did that for us, for you and for me. Furthermore, we know when we read in Luke chapter 19, the story of Zacchaeus. And here was a man who was hated by the people of his day because of his occupation, but he was curious about Jesus, and so he climbed that tree. And do you remember the verse at the end of the story? Jesus says, The Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. You see, the religious people of that day, they didn't like the fact that Jesus was spending time with Zacchaeus. They didn't like the fact that He was going to go to Zacchaeus' house. He was going to eat and fellowship with sinners. But Jesus said, this is exactly where I need to be. Because God cares about the lost, and I do too. God sent His Son to die for those who were lost, that they might be saved. Jesus spent His time on earth going to the lost and telling them what changes they needed to make in their life in order to be saved. And we see Him pass on that same idea to His apostles. If you will look with me at Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. And verses 1 through 11 is what we'll be reading. The Bible says, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw upon the lake two boats, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now you need to understand, this was a difficult thing for Simon to hear. It was a difficult thing for Simon to do. Why? Because he was a professional fisherman. Anybody here this morning like to fish? All right. One of life's simple pleasures to go out there and Throw your line out and see what you can catch. These guys didn't do it for fun. They did it for a living. They were professional fishermen. And if anybody knew how to catch fish on the Sea of Galilee, that's the Lake of Gennesaret, another name for it, it was these guys. But despite their best efforts that day, they had not caught a thing. And then here comes this young preacher saying, Hey, you need to put out your net so you can catch some fish. I'm guessing these guys had a hard time accepting that. How many of you would like for your preacher to go with you while you're fishing and critique the way you're doing it? Simon could have said, hey, Jesus, you stick to teaching, let me do the fishing. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know how to do this. And if there's any fish to be caught, I would have caught them. But he didn't say that. 
Notice what he said. He said, Master, we have toiled all night and we haven't caught anything. But at your word, I will let down the nets. He said, I don't think the result's going to be any different. But Jesus, I respect you enough that I'm going to do what you said to do, even though I don't think it's going to work. And the Bible says they, when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets began to break. We're not talking about catching a few bluegill or a few crappie. They were catching so many fish, the nets wouldn't hold them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. Have you ever been fishing and caught so many fish the boat was sinking on the way back to the dock? Never been there. Would like to do it one day. Clearly, clearly the Lord was at work. And when Simon Peter saw it, the Bible says he fell down at Jesus' knees and he said, Depart from me. For I am a sinful man, O Lord. They were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. But notice what Jesus said. Verse 10. Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And the Bible says when they brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed Him. I want you to understand that Peter here, and his brother, and James, and John, they all had this fishing business together. But when Jesus called them, they left their occupation behind and everything they knew, everything that was familiar, and they said, we're going to follow Jesus wherever He goes. Matthew 4, 19 says it this way, Come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they did. You see, these men knew there was something different about Jesus. He spoke and taught as one who had authority. And they had the courage to drop what they were doing and follow the Master. On another occasion, we read in Mark chapter 2 and verse 17 these words. Jesus says, Those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Any of you been to the doctor lately? I got three kids, so we live there at the doctor's office, right? I mean, they just catch everything that's going around at school. It gets embarrassing, so my wife and I say, okay, it's your turn to go. I just went to the doctor yesterday. You got to go today. That way they don't think it's the same person all the time. I mean, we go to the doctor. How many of you went to the doctor because you were sick? That's why I go. How many of you went to the doctor this week and said, Doctor, there's absolutely nothing wrong with me. I'm 100% fine. I've never been as fit in my life. And I just wanted to go and share the good news with you. Nobody does that, right? Why do we go to the doctor? Because we're sick. Because we need help. Jesus said, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners repentance. That was his mission. That was his focus. And did it get him in trouble? You better believe it did. There were some in religious circles who said, Jesus, you ought not to fill, uh, stain yourself with the sins of these people that you're hanging out with. Why do you spend time with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said, because this is who needs me most. If you would, look at Acts chapter 1. What I want you to see here is that Jesus knew His time on earth was going to be short. He spent only three years in that earthly ministry. And He knew that He was about to ascend into heaven. And so I want you to listen to the words that He gave His followers in Acts chapter 1. In verse 8, he told them, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He said, This is your mission. These are your marching orders. And it's going to start in Jerusalem, and then it's going to make its way to Judea and Samaria, and it's eventually going to cover the whole rest of the world. Now, 
Fast forward to Acts chapter 8. You'll remember in Acts chapter 7, we read about the stoning of Stephen, right? The first Christian martyr. And we read in Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 1, that on that day a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. I want you to see that Acts 8 and verse 4 is a direct fulfillment of what we read in Acts 1 and verse 8. And they were comfortable in Jerusalem. And they might not have ever gone to Judea and Samaria, but God used a difficult chapter in their life, this chapter of persecution, to spread them out to where they needed to go and to do what they needed to do. And, and the irony in the whole story is the people who hated these followers of Jesus, they thought they were stamping this movement out, but really they were just helping to spread it. Because the Bible says in verse 4, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Everywhere they went, they shared the gospel. And it spread like wildfire in the first century. If you read the book of Acts, and we don't have time to read it in its entirety this morning, but if you've read it before, you know how quickly the church grew, right? There were 3,000 on that first day of the church at Pentecost who were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And thousands and thousands more were coming to the Lord. And the apostles carried on the work that Jesus began. And if we need to see their rationale, we can see it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In the book of Acts, we read about Paul. And here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verses 16 to 21, he tells us his understanding of his mission. He says, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ in this way, we regard Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And the old has passed away, and behold, all things, uh, the new has come. And all of this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself, and gave us, you and me, the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation, therefore we are Christ's ambassadors. God, making His appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God for our sake. He made Him who, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. You need to understand that Paul gave his life to this mission of seeking and saving the lost. He said that's why we don't regard anybody from a worldly point of view. We don't look at them according to the flesh. Instead, he says we have this ministry of reconciliation. And Paul dedicated his life to it. And what was his message? We see it in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 23. He said, we preach Christ crucified. And that was the message for which he gave his life. So let's fast forward to today. If Jesus lived here in Wilson County in the 21st century, what would Jesus do today? I would suggest to you this morning that he would do exactly what he did in the first century. He would look for those who were sick. He would look for those who were suffering. He would look for those who were in pain. He would look for those who were in lost. And he would tell them about his loving Heavenly Father. He would compel them to repent of their sins. And he would ask them to follow him and share the good news with others. That's what Jesus would do. And he wouldn't spend all his time with religious people, even though that's important to have good friends in the church. And young people, if you're hearing me today, your best friends need to be faithful Christians, okay? But there should also be space and time in our lives when we reach out to those who are lost, especially those of us who are mature in the faith. And so what should we do today? 
I think we should do exactly what they did in the first century. We should go and make disciples, the Bible says. And that word go is, is a participle. If you look at the uh, uh, language here, it means while you're going or as you are going, make disciples. That's the main verb, right? While you go about your daily business, while you work, while you visit with family, while you shop, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, make disciples. Or to put it in fishing terms, we need to go find the fish. If we're going to catch fish, we've got to go where the fish are, right? If you throw a line in my bathtub at home, you're not going to catch anything because the fish aren't there. Just because you throw the bait into a body of water doesn't mean you're going to catch anything. And that's why we use those depth finders and that's why we, we have fishing guides that show us the best places to go because we need to go to where the fish are. They will not just jump into our boat. Brothers and sisters, we need to teach. We need to speak the truth in love. We need to tell people the same message we read in Acts 4 and verse 12, that there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so I want to leave you this morning with three ideas for evangelism. Three keys to evangelism in a postmodern, post-Christian world. And the first one is found here in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15. Peter writes and he says, Always be prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. What he's talking about here is apologetics. And that doesn't mean we make an apology in the sense that we say, I'm sorry. Instead, apologetics is the study of the Christian faith whereby we provide evidence for those who may be searching for the truth that we've already found in Scripture. Always be prepared. I was a Boy Scout growing up. Anybody do Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts growing up? What was the motto? Be prepared, right? In the same way, we as Christians need to be prepared to defend our faith, to defend the gospel, to give a reason to people who ask us, what's different about you? But it matters how we do it too. It must be done with gentleness and respect. Second key to evangelism today is found in Ephesians 4 and verse 16. He says He gave some to be apostles, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. But what was the point? The point is in verse 16. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint which it is, with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. And I italicize that line, when each part is working properly. We're going to talk in the class hour about what that means. But what I want you to see is evangelism is the task of the entire church body that you and I, every one of us here today, should be involved in this great work of evangelism. And then third, the third key is found in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. You remember the story, right? Isaiah has just said he saw the Lord and it was moving. And he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the Lord. And the angel took a coal of fire and touched it to his lips. And Jesus said, or the Lord said, I've got some important work to do. And Isaiah didn't say, I'm not ready. He didn't say, I, I just was cleansed from my sins. Instead, he says, I'm ready right now. Here am I, send me. Brothers and sisters, the Bible says in Luke chapter 10 that the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. 
Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers or laborers out into His field. That's my prayer today, that we understand this is our task. This is not just their mission, it's also our mission. I want you to focus on the words we read in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16. The Bible says, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. That's what we need to be doing. That's what He wants us to do. And if we will do that, it will please the Lord. And I want you to notice the last line here in Mark 16 as we close. It says, And they went out and preached everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. I promise you, if you're willing to go today, the Lord will be with you and will work with you to accomplish His purposes in this world. When is the last time you personally led someone to Jesus Christ? When is the last time you tried? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go fishing this week. All right? Tell your wife, hey, the preacher said I need to go fishing. I want you to go fishing for men. I want you to understand this is not a suggestion, it is a command. It's just as much a command as loving one another or forgiving each other. You see, if you're not fishing, then you're rebelling against God. You're disobeying your Heavenly Father. And so I beg you, do not continue to sit on the bank. Nobody ever caught a fish sitting on the sidelines. We've got enough spectators in this world. We need participants. There are 7.6 billion people on earth and they need to hear the gospel. So we've got some work to do. My prayer is that you will go fishing for men. It's time to go to work. You may have failed in the past. You may not have caught many fish in your life. You may have entertained thoughts of giving up. But it's time to go to work. There are fish to be caught. There are souls to be saved. So brothers and sisters, go seek and save the lost. And if you're here this morning and you say, that's me, preacher, I'm lost. If you've never given your life to Christ in baptism, then I urge you to do that this morning. The Bible says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And if you're ready to confess your belief that Jesus Christ is Lord, He is the Son of God, He is the Savior of the world. If you're ready to repent of your sins, then you can be baptized today. If you're ready to do that, please come forward right now as we stand and sing. Entrance within demanding Whose is the voice I hear? Sweet lay the tones of calling Open the door for me If thou wilt heed my calling I will abide with thee All through the dark
closing song is number 612. That's 612. We'll sing the first verse. Afterwards, Gary Southerth will lead us in prayer. 244 present today. If you're visiting with us, I invite you to come back any opportunity that you have. And if you filled out one of the blue attendance cards, please pass them on to the inside aisle to be collected as we sing. And a reminder once again that all the classes, high school and above, will remain here in the auditorium. 612. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your brother Johnson who has come before us this morning with a lesson that should touch our hearts and help us to go and seek and save the lost. And dear Lord, we ask that you be with us as we apply what we've heard this morning. Help us to examine ourselves. Help us to pour out the portions of our heart that are filled with worldly matters and worldly love, that it may be filled with love for you and love for others, that we may take the gospel message to the lost. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.